Welcome back. Hey, this is lecture number five, and we're on page number 25, and I think we made it through almost an entire page, actually a half a page. All right, we're making progress now. We're talking about now the, uh, of course, the death of Christ, and now we're talking about some New Testament passages. The atonement is the reason for the incarnation. That's what your notes say. And uh, we're talking about this, this work of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's several verses of Scripture here. We're not going to take time to look at each one of them, but... Um, if you would, uh, let's uh, take a look at a, we'll take a look at the first one and the last one. How's that sound? So, um, um, Brother David, if you wouldn't mind, Mark chapter ten, verse number forty-five. Do you have it there? And then, uh, and then, Brother um, 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 Sean. <laughs> we need name tags, you know. Uh, the Hebrew, Hebrews chapter two. Okay. So, uh, Brother, if you would please. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. All right, so what we're talking about is the purpose of the incarnation. Christ came in order to give his life a ransom. So there's this, there's this intent, okay? So what we're talking about is, is reason. Uh, the, in, the reason for the incarnation was to point to uh, the cross itself, all right? And then Hebrews chapter 2, if you would please. Uh, Hebrews 2.14. 2, for 14. as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood... He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. All righty. And so what we have here is taking, uh, he too, he, he took, he basically he took on himself flesh, the incarnation. He came to this earth, took on flesh so that he could die. So there's purpose there. And so what we're talking about, the fact is the, uh, you know, because we're talking about the death of Christ now. So there's purpose involved. So the, the New Testament points to the fact that Jesus Christ came in, uh, he was born in order to be able to give his life a sacrifice. And you'll notice there that in number two there, that note, the atonement, is the kernel of the gospel message. That's, uh, that's not original with me. That was someone else's uh, statement about that. But in other words, the kernel. In other words, that's where um, the gospel springs forth out of the death of Christ. And, and uh, uh, I have a couple of scriptures down here. Uh, that, poor, that particular one in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And verse number two, and uh, Sister Rachel, would you mind reading that for us? This is 1 Corinthians 2, 2. And this is, this is Paul speaking, um, and he is, he's talking about um, his preaching, uh, his, uh, the message that he goes to the churches and preaches, and that is what? For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. What a great truth that is. And so, the, you know, his, uh, his, his ministry, his message uh, is a message of salvation through Jesus Christ. And that salvation is, is brought to us because of his death. And so, I mean, if you, I mean, if, if you have a preaching ministry that doesn't deal with the death of Christ, you're, you're really missing the point. Because that's what we preach. We preach Christ and him crucified. That's, that's our message. Um, and, of course, the, the other reference I have down here, of course, is chapter 15. And, and uh, of course, it starts off by the, with the gospel. Moreover, I declare unto you the gospel. And, and, uh, and of course, the gospel message uh, is, revolves around the death of Christ. And um, verse number 3, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, that's interesting because what scripture is he talking about? Mm -hmm. Old Testament. Old Testament, okay, this is Paul, and he's talking about Old Testament scripture, yes sir? But in this particular case, since this book was written, say, maybe 20 years after Christ, that it would also include whatever gospel narratives were written? Certainly, I believe that Mark's gospel had already been written by this point, and it is very likely that Matthew's uh, followed shortly after, and so it's, it is sure, certainly possible. I don't know how much they were circulated, please Please be reminded here, he's talking to the church in Corinth. Right. He's not talking to the church down the street from Jerusalem, okay? I don't know if they were widely circulated at that point. I doubt that they were. And so I believe that when Paul is talking about Scripture, I believe specifically he's talking right. about Old Testament Scripture. Just the same thing that we were just finished talking about, that the Old, the Old Testament has these, has these pictures of a suffering Savior, and I believe he is making yeah. reference to that. And so... Um, he said that Christ died according to the scriptures and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of Cephas. And of course, 
and then the and then the other twelve. But we we see here very clearly that uh, Paul the apostle his his preaching ministry emphasized the death of Christ. And so I'm not saying that every time you stand in the pulpit you've got to preach a long message about the death of Christ. But what I what I I see what Paul's doing is. When he got into a, in, in, into a church and he's, and he's ministering, he's making sure that, that people understand this is what Christ did for you. And that's, that was the central part of his message. It was not just a matter of, let's just love one another. Right. You know? Um, well, how did God love us? Yeah. Yeah, he sent his son to die for us. Right. So if we want to talk about love, let's talk about sacrificial love. If we want to talk about sacrificial love, let's look what Christ did. Okay. And he takes on the anti-argument in verse 14 through the end of the chapter. He says, uh, if he's not risen, then our preaching is in vain. Exactly We're right. Wasting our time. Yeah. So, you know, uh, of course, chapter 15, I mean, first of all, it's a gigantic chapter. And uh, secondly, he goes, he, he, he starts talking about the death of Christ and then builds the story, uh, builds the argument for the resurrection. And then the, the nature of the resurrection and the importance of the resurrection. And he talks about... Um, and of course, you know, it's even, of course, mentioning in here about even uh, portions about the rapture, you know, that we're going to be changed in a moment, the twinkle of an eye. Um, and so at the Trump, you know, at the, at the last Trump. And so, uh, you know, all those things are built in there. And it, of course, it all starts with the death of Christ. All these great benefits starts with the fact that Christ died for us. So without that, without, without that kernel, that central uh, point about Christ dying for our sins, None of this stuff would ever apply. There is no resurrection of the dead unless Christ has died. You know, there is no hope of, of eternal life without the, without the death of Christ. And that is, that is such an essential uh, point of that. Um, you'll notice there, the atonement is a theme of heavenly songs. And uh, that's a great verse there in Revelation chapter, chapter 5. Uh, let's just go over there real quick. This is, um, um, I just started last night over at Lehigh Valley. Uh, the class on the book of Revelation. And so these next five weeks, I'll be heading over there for fun and excitement. Um, Are you te teaching the doctrine or just the book? The book, oh, okay. yeah. Um, they have another class over there on eschatology. I taught that a couple years ago, mm -hmm. which, which covers more of the theology. Mm -hmm. This is more of, covers the, the, you know, the structure of the book and things oh. like that. Okay, so there, there is... You know, it's kind of a fuzzy line, but there is a difference between eschatology and studying the book of Revelation. Right. There is a little bit of a difference. So we just started that last night. Um, and so uh, eventually, if I don't talk too long uh, in the class over there, um, they, do, they do try to limit my discussions there. But um, they, they push the button and say, you've got to stop right now. Um, Revelation chapter 5, verse 3. This is seen in heaven. Um, Talked about the uh, verse number eight. Uh, he had taken the book, the four beasts, so they're angelic beings, and the four and twenty elders. And if you were, um, as we've been going through our uh, eschatology study in Sunday school, we talked about the four and twenty elders. I believe that the four and twenty four and twenty elders represents believers that have been resurrected or raptured at the time of the beginning of the tribulation, and they go into this you know existence in heaven. And are represented um, as the uh, as the twenty as twenty four was a representation of the royal priesthood in the Old Testament. So four and twenty represents us as being God's royal priesthood when we're in heaven. So I believe the four and twenty elders represents all of the resurrected and raptured saints, and that puts us up there in heaven. Okay, and what we'll be doing when we get there. We're going, to fall, uh, we're going to fall down before the Lamb, it says in verse number 8, having everyone with, we're going to have harps, by the way, uh, and golden vials uh, full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, and this is, uh, so just work on your singing, okay, because you're going to be doing a lot of that when you get to heaven, all right? Mm -hmm. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. And why is that? For thou wast slain. And thou hast redeemed us unto God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nations. Talk about the Gentiles here also. Uh, and thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests and shall reign on the earth. And so this is uh, the scene in heaven. And this 
um, this you know glorious um, scene here uh, is brought about uh, because of the recognition of who Jesus Christ is, and the beginning of that recognition is the fact that he's he was slain, he died for us, and so this is um, this is a scene in heaven. Um, uh, let me just mention you don't we don't need to turn there. Let me just mention this in passing in Luke chapter nine. Uh, matter of fact, I think. Um, all four gospels. I think all four gospels has the Mount of Transfiguration, and um, of course, two, two folks uh, with the Lord Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration. That was Moses and Elijah. Yep, Moses and Elijah. And what they speak about, and the, of course, the Moses and Elijah, they're already dead, all right, and they have, uh, uh, you know, they appear before with Christ there on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they speak about his up and coming death. So. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see it where you know Jesus is kind of filling them in. Let me just tell you what's going to happen, guys, so you know, you know, you know what what's going to be playing out in the next couple of days here. I, I think, I think they uh, Moses and Elijah who are in heaven have an understanding of what is about ready to transpire, and so they're speaking about these things. And it's a very interesting conversation. I'm sure they had. And, you know, if, if, you know, if Peter wasn't so overwhelmed by their presence and saying, I'm going to build me a tent for these guys, uh, he probably would have learned something, you know. Um, so he, um, so these two men had conversation with Christ. You know, they're already dead. They're having conversation with Christ concerning the upcoming events of his, of his death on the cross. So what that kind of fills me in on is there is an understanding of the death of Christ even in heaven today uh, by the saints of, you know, saints of God and of course it already happened but we go back to prior to the crucifixion did they have an understanding of the death of Christ? Well I would say yes um, because of what we just talked about the fact the Old Testament laid out this, um, this uh, suffering Savior so they understood, especially Moses, of course, he, he wrote his five books of the Bible, and, and so he had a full, I think, had a full understanding, of course, after he got to heaven, kind of all kind of fell in place. Lester, Lester Roll said uh, with this passage, he goes, there's Jesus, and he's got his lawyer, referring to Moses, uh -huh. and his witness, there's a lawyer. So when he's going into court, he's got his lawyer. He's got his lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess I don't know. I'll preach somewhere along the line. <laughs> Got a witness in the lawyer. Amen. All right. So um, anyway, the uh, the understanding of the death of Christ um, is certainly an Old Testament uh, painted. The, the picture is painted very well in the Old Testament, and as we come into the New Testament, it is presented for us with. In, there's intent there. Christ, Christ had this intention when he came. Uh, and we see that it's a central part of the message that's preached uh, in, in the New Testament, of course, by the apostles. And, and uh, we're, we see also that it was, it's a major theme even in heaven, even after it's all said and done. It centers around the lamb that was slain uh, from the foundation of the world. Um, number two there, the death, of cross was, the death of Christ was necessary. Okay, Note that Jesus believed that it was necessary. And I got John chapter 3. And uh, verse number 14 and 15. And so, um, uh, Brother Mike, if you have it right there, could you read that? Of course, 14 and 15 leading up to uh, chapter 16, or verse number 16, but um, uh, John chapter 3, verse number 14 and 15. Yeah, okay. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. All right. And so we, what we have knit together here, of course, is this Old Testament reference with the you know, serpent lifting up in the wilderness. We have that Old Testament reference there. But we have this, uh, this, uh, you know, this idea of necessity. Christ said this is necessary. Um, so just as Moses did that, so must also the Son of Man be lifted up. It was necessary. So this is, uh, you know, when we talk about the death of Christ, uh, it, it was a, it was, it was, again, it's not accidental. And we're going to talk about some of these false theories here in just a minute. 
but it wasn't accidental. It was there was necessity involved with that. Okay, um, so um, a couple of blanks to fill in there. Christ uh, number one there. Christ died to satisfy the law of God. He died to satisfy the law of God, and of course this is a big part of uh, of why Christ died. Um, a couple verses, I have Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 22 there, uh, which says, without the shedding of blood is no remission, okay? And, of course, the book of Hebrews, and that's a whole section there, it's dealing with the sacraments and the sacrificial system. The book of Hebrews, and um, uh, I'm going to be teaching uh, Hebrews over at Lehigh Valley coming up uh, probably sometime later in the spring. And... In, in that class, what I emphasize is the superiority of Christ over all these Old Testament um, events and, and people. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than the high priest. He's greater than the sacrificial system. And so it's, a, it's about the superiority of Jesus Christ. And so when we see um, uh, Hebrews chapter 9 about without the shedding of blood is no remission, it's a reminder to us that, that the blood of Christ is now superior to even all the sacraments of all the Old Testament. So um, it was it satisfied God's law. Go with me uh, and write this other reference down, and that's Isaiah chapter 53. If you would go back with me there, please, Isaiah chapter 53. And, of course, we were looking at this passage earlier as we got started, and it is a tremendous portion of Scripture in so many different ways, uh, because it, it speaks about his substitutionary death, it talks about the punishment that he would receive, about our benefits from it. Uh, but I've said this before from the pulpit on, on several occasions, and you've probably heard me uh, make reference to this, but verse number 11 uh, is um, what I feel uh, one of the most important portions of this, of this uh, passage of scripture in Isaiah chapter 53 where it says in verse number 11, he, talking about God the Father, shall see the travail of his soul, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse number 11, uh, verse number 11 says this, and shall be satisfied. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is such an important part of this portion of scripture, that Christ would do all these things, take our place, receive our punishment, and, and for what purpose? Um, was it just to be nice to you? <laughs> Uh, what Christ did was to satisfy the requirements of God's law. Because, and we're going to talk about this in more detail as we talk about things, you know, like propitiation and, and like, um, you know, he, uh, anyway, we'll get into more details. Uh, but God's, God's law had to be satisfied. You know, God is a God of love, but he's also a holy God. And so if he has a law and the law has been violated, he's not just going to say, oh, that's okay, you know. And he's not like the big grandpa in heaven that, you know, looks at their real nasty grandkids and says, but i got to love them anyway, you know. And that's just not the way it works. So God's law has to be satisfied, and that's what this verse says, that God was satisfied. So this is a, this is a, a wonderful reminder of what Christ's death did. It satisfied um, God's law, we see it in the book of Hebrews, of course, the shedding of blood where sins have been remitted. We see here in Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, but secondly, um, and, and this is the kind of the re, uh, just kind of like the other side of the coin, it satisfies God's love. Um, and, you know, as Brother Mike read that verse just a little bit ago, and then added verse number 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So that giving of his only begotten son is not just talking about the incarnation, okay? He gave him to be a sacrifice for our sins. You know, we go back to, you know, that portion of scripture in Genesis where we were just reading earlier, God will provide himself a lamb. And so he gave, um, because of his love, he provided what was necessary for this, you know, this work of, uh, of salvation, this restoration, this, you know, gaining the souls of men back uh, because of his love for us. So um, he has a law that has to be satisfied, but he also has a love for us. Uh, and so Christ's death satisfied both of them. Because he loves you, he was willing to sacrifice or give his only begotten son. 
And because he is a holy God and just God, he gave his only begotten son in order to satisfy the requirements of the law, which you violated. So we have both of these things going on at one time. Um, this is a quote from Brother Robert Sargent's uh, theology work. And um, in the atoning death of Jesus Christ, the great dilemma facing God was resolved. How could God love the sinner and still punish sin? Um, well, of course, Christ is the answer. And so Christ was the substitutionary um, the substitutionary work of atonement. In other words, his punishment, um, our, our, our punishment was placed upon him. So both were satisfied, okay? The, the next section here uh, deals with uh, unscriptural views of the death of Christ. And there are a bunch, right? Um, the first one here, um, we'll deal with the first one. We'll take a short break and then we'll, uh, we'll care, uh, pick up the rest of them here. Uh, the first one is the is the accidental um, uh, theory, all right, that Christ, Christ, uh, basically, the theory stated, if you would, that Christ was a victim, that Christ was a victim. Um, so Christ's death was not intended, and that's how they would feel about it, because of politics, because of the, you know, the religious atmosphere, uh, that Christ was basically was, you know, was a, it was the he was a victim of circumstances of his day. Um, that is actually held by um, several groups. Um, the uh, the proponents of Islam hold the to that. that. What's that? The Jews hold that. Yeah. Um, if they believe he exists. Well, they, they would believe he exists, but he was just a, a you know, a, if you would, a prophet, and, uh, and he was killed like other prophets. Mm -hmm. So, um, but Islam holds to that. Uh, I'm, I remember so clearly one day I'm work, I was doing some stuff on base and I was sitting around um, loading AK-47s with this young man who was, uh, who was Kurdish and he was Muslim and we had a really nice conversation. He was very open and, and willing to talk about it. And, and he, he, said, um, he said that um, um, he talked about Judaism, he talked about Christianity and he said, you know, uh, Judaism was the first floor. Um, Christianity was the second floor. Uh, but Jesus, you know, when he died, um, then God brought in Islam to put their roof on the whole thing. You know, this, this was their idea that, you know, Jesus came, but he failed. And when he failed, God had to do one more thing. And he, he completed his work by, by sending his prophet Muhammad and providing, you know, the Quran and the final teaching, and and, and he, his work is completed now. So that's that is their mentality that Christ's death was um, basically a failure of his ministry, an unforeseen failure. It, it would have to be unforeseen, correct? So this is this is their idea. So the accidental death thing is is not something. It's just kind of bizarre. I mean, you're talking about one of the fastest growing religions on the planet, Islam, with over a billion proponents uh, believing that the, that the death of Christ was an accident and not something foreseen. So this, um, it, take, take your Bibles, do I have a, let me see here. Yeah, I got a couple verses down here, don't I? Matthew chapter uh, 16, verse number 21. Um, and then also, um, uh, Brother David, would you go to John chapter 10? And um, we'll take a look at that also. So, um, um, Brother Ryan, do you have, are you at Matthew 16 yet? 1621? Matthew 1621. This is, uh, of course, Christ speaking to his apostles. If I'm um, trying to remember the context here, I. Um, I think, yeah, we're, we're just past that portion of Scripture where he's been in Caesarea, Philippi. Who, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? You know, Peter, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then we go to Matthew chapter six, uh, 16, 21, right? From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and be raised again the third day. 
Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's no accident there. That is, I mean, very clear. And of course, immediately after that, Peter, you know, of course, opens mouth and inserts big foot, you know, and uh, let it be not, you know, not so. And, and then we go to John chapter ten, if you would please. First one. Uh, I'm sorry, seventeen and eighteen. Okay. John ten, seventeen yes, and eighteen. Therefore, doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. All right. Mm -hmm. This commandment have I received of yes. my Father. There you go. So there is absolutely no accidental event here. I mean, it's you could see it's purposeful. He purposely laid down his life, and so uh, that accidental theory, um, you know, it doesn't. It just doesn't. It doesn't fly. All right. The next one here. Uh, matter of fact, we'll take a short break and, and uh, we'll be kind and rewind after this. Um, and we'll finish up with our, our last lecture. <clears throat>